yes, we say this phrase, the very words, just to distinguish God's word from my own. One verse uh, today. Keep your life free from love of money and be content with what you have, for he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. You could be seated. We are uh, the third sermon into a four-week series called Making Kingdom Choices. And we began that series simply by saying that in order to make kingdom choices, you have to have a kingdom mindset. And a kingdom mindset is really framed by four questions. Number one, who am I? Four questions that everybody has to answer. But if you're a Christian, the answers to these questions are all through the scriptures, but we use Colossians 3 as our as our text to answer these questions. So who am I? The answer to that question as a believer is simply, I am someone who's been raised to walk in new life with Jesus. I have a completely new identity because I've confessed with my mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in my heart that God raised him from the dead. So who am I? A raised follower of Jesus. I have a new life. Question number two, who is the king? It's the question everybody has to answer in life. Who is the king? As believers, we answer that question, uh, Jesus Christ is the king. Question number three, what are my values? We said from Colossians chapter three that our values are things that are above, not things that are below. Jesus would call things that are below things that would pass away, that wouldn't last very long, but things that are above, things that are eternal. Jesus said things like this, like, don't Don't invest uh, treasure on earth where moth and rust destroy, but instead store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. It's the above, below, I mean, yeah, below, above concept. And so that's what happens when you get your nonverbals and your verbals all mixed up at once. Anybody ever done that? No? I did. So, uh, and so things that are above versus things that are below. And then the last question, where is my hope? So everybody's got to answer this question, where is my hope? And our hope as believers is in the simple fact that we will share in the inheritance of Almighty God. We will rule and reign when Jesus returns. That is the hope of the scriptures, the hope of the gospel. Now, all that, if, if, I'm a, if I'm a new, I have a new life in Christ, that Christ is the king, my values are things that are above, not things that are below, and my hope is in the return of Christ, then I, then I make decisions or I make choices based on that mindset, based on that lens. And today, we, last week, we, we talked about family. Today, we come to the concept of money. One of the things that I like to do when I'm talking about a topic with church is I'll just Google like American Christians and whatever the topic is. And I did that with money. And the, and the it's interesting because you, you get to see sort of the internet's view of what's most important about, or at least Google's view of what's most important about American Christians and money. And what comes up is actually disheartening. And what's disheartening about it is that it propagates a false gospel instantly, what I would call uh, a money cult among the, Christian, the American Christian Culture And the idea of that money cult is that if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, and if you just believe enough, you will be blessed. And the idea behind blessing there is that you will have a lot of money. Now, our lives, most of us, will prove that just because you confessed Christ doesn't necessarily mean you will have a lot of money. Who's with me? Come on. It, it, it's not the same for everybody. Jesus is the same, but money is not equal to the confession of Christ. And so <clears throat> it's, a false, it's a false gospel, right? It's this idea that Jesus equals money is very American, very false. Like if I can't take, a go- if I can't take the gospel and, and, and make sure that it's going to work sitting on a rock with some Bedouin in, in Sudan, if it doesn't work there, <clears throat> it's a false gospel, right? So there's no promise of money with the gospel of Jesus Christ. So I, I hope everybody hear this. So, so, so the financial pr- prosperity in and of itself does not equate to the blessing of God, and poverty in and of itself does not equal a sin or a lack of blessing, okay? Um, <clears throat> it's important for us to, to understand 
One time I was in uh, Ukraine about 20 years ago, and I, was, I played soccer. I shouldn't have because I was playing with people that are really good, and I was really retired. But I played uh, soccer with uh, these guys, and I herniated a disc in my back, L4, L5, S1. I, I'll, I'll never forget. You don't forget that. And so uh, they laid me up in a house until this trip was over. It was a simple house, and I laid in this living room, and they, there was a TV, and I, I had like two days before we, we were all leaving, and so I just had to wait because I could, I could barely walk. And the only thing that was on TV in English in U- Zhitomir, Ukraine, was the tele... tele the, the, I think it was TBN. You know TBN, right? All these TV preachers. And it was like, it was false gospel, false gospel, false gospel, because it was just over and over again. It was saying like, if, if you will just... If you will just Uh, receive Jesus, you'll just have enough faith and you'll have money. And I'm thinking, that doesn't work in post-Soviet Ukraine in those moments. It didn't work. That's a false, false gospel, right? So we don't take our money and equate it as either, either blessing or curse. There can be really bad people with a lot of money, right? So hear that for what it is and let's start this way. So I'm gonna give you three principles as, it, as we come to making kingdom choices when it comes to uh, money. And the very first one I'm gonna call the principle of contentment. And this is from Hebrews chapter 13, verse five. We read it, I'll read it to you again. Keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. This is the principle of contentment. The principle of contentment says that we find contentment in the presence of God not in money. We find contentment in the presence of God, not in money. So we love God. We don't love money. It's not our pursuit. It's not our main pursuit. It's not our main passion. Uh, The love of God is our, our passion. If you go on in this scripture, you find out that your security comes from the presence of God, not from money. And I just think as American Christians, we get this one a little, a little jacked up in our thinking. Because a lot of times we think if I can just get this much money or that much money or if I can find contentment if I can move from this neighborhood to that neighborhood or gain one more sort of material possession, you fill in the blank. Uh, If I can have that, I'll have contentment. And what I can tell you is that my own life indicates that uh, it more does not mean more contentment. More materialism, material possessions it does not mean more, more contentment. And talking with some very, very wealthy people, I would find that you can be very, very wealthy and have many houses and not be content. Okay? So, so contentment, whether you have a lot or you have a little, is found only in the presence of God. Uh, sometimes when we have a little, we focus on the fact that we have a little. It takes our eyes off Jesus, and we lose a sense of contentment because we're focused on we only have this much. Our contentment doesn't come in how much we have or how little we have. It cont- comes in the presence of God, right? And so this is where we find our contentment, and this is the principle of contentment. It's focusing on things that are above, not things that are below, right? Second principle. The principle of the widow's might. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to read from Mark chapter 12, 41 to 44, but let me just set the stage with you. Jesus has his disciples. They're sitting outside the treasury of the temple. Outside the treasury of the temple are offering boxes, offering receptacles. What's happening is that they're just watching as all these people are coming by and they're making their offerings. Some of them are making big offerings and everything is coins. They're still digging up coins from uh, that time period right there at the the treasury. They find them over and over and over again. And that some of them are pouring with loud clanging coins into this offering receptacle as to be seen so that everybody can see, look, Look how much money uh, I'm giving. And here's what Jesus does. He tells his disciples, that think of this. He tells them, stop what you're doing and look at this. Watch this. He wants them to have this in, in their mind. Verse tw- uh, Mark chapter 12, 41 to 44. And he sat down opposite the treasury and watched the people putting money into the offering box. Many rich people put in large sums. 
And a poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which make a penny. And he called his disciples to him and said to them, truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the offering box. For they all contributed out of their abundance, but she out of her poverty has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. So here's the principle of the widow's might. The principle of the widow's might would say to us, it's not that God wants a percentage of your money, it's that he wants your whole heart. He doesn't want a percentage of your money, he wants your whole heart, as evidenced in this passage of scripture. Some rich people were dumping lots of money in, he doesn't point them out, he points the widow out who puts in what's equivalent to one penny or everything that she has. And he says, that is what it's about. He doesn't want a percentage of your money, he wants your whole heart. Harkens back to Deuteronomy chapter six when when we learn we should love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our might. Money is never about money for God. Do, Do you realize this, that God does not need your money? He has it all, everything he needs. He he does not need one thing from us. He's not dependent on anything that I would ever do for him. He does not need my money. What he wants is my heart. And here's the thing, it is just true. You can follow someone's money and find their heart. That's just true. It doesn't matter how much or how little. The widow is a great example. Follow her money. Where's her heart? Right? And so that's the principle of the widow's might, that he doesn't need a percentage. He doesn't want your money. He wants your heart. It's not about the amount of money, but but whether or not he has your whole heart. Here's the third principle. I'm going to call it the principle of cheerful giving. This comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 9, 6 to 8. Again, let me set the context. Paul is writing to the church at Corinth. To the church at Corinth, he is saying to them, among other things, hey, there are Christians in Jerusalem. Let me just be a master of, of the obvious. Corinth is far away from Jerusalem. So this church of Corinth is not like raising money for themselves. They're now raising money for Christians that are in Jerusalem. But Paul's appealing to them in these verses to make a kingdom investment, a cheerful kingdom investment, because the gospel started in Jerusalem and it went out from there and we should continue to see the gospel flourish in Jerusalem. And then we come to these, these, this scripture, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, 6 to 8. The point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. This is the principle of cheerful giving. Now, as I was laying in that, uh, that room in Ukraine, you remember, have you tracked with me? Remember that story from 10 minutes ago? So I'm, I'm, I'm in the, that floor of that hotel, I mean that house, and my back is killing me, and I, I'm laying on a mat in the floor watching this TV, and this person says, if you will give, I think it was $1,144.44, if you will give $1,144.44 right now, I will send you a prayer cloth and I was hurting. I was thinking to myself, I could use one of those prayer cloths <laughs> right, right now. But this guy was like compulsive. He's like, if you don't have $1,144.44, if you have, you know, $114.44, if you don't have that, then if you have $11.44, then you send it right here, right now. And I'm going to pray for your healing. You're going to sow a seed, which they get, they get this idea from 
this, this verse, if you, what you sow sparingly, you reap sparingly and all, all that stuff. You sow a seed and you're going you're gonna to find healing or you're going to find what you need. You're going to find favor with God for $11.44 or $1,144.44. And I remember thinking, I also have my Bible there. I was reading the Gospel of Matthew at the time. And I came across, or I thought about that widow's might thing again. It's like, she couldn't afford, she couldn't afford God's grace in this whole, whole thing. She only had a penny. So what does she, what does she do? You know, it's just such a, such a false, false gospel. So the idea of sowing and reaping that is focused on in this passage, the passage is really about giving cheerfully. It's really about giving, not on, because of reluctance or some kind of compulsion, like you've been guilt-motivated to give, but it's giving cheerfully because of God, because of who he is, because we have a, we have a kingdom mindset, and we sow that, we're going to reap bountifully. Now, people want to fill in that blank, like, you know what, if you give $100 today, I promise in the next 30 days, you will get $1,000 back. That is wrong. The text simply says that if, if you sow sparingly, you'll reap sparingly, and if you sow bountifully, you'll reap bountifully, and it finds its fruition in verse 8 that says that you may abound in every good works, so that God is going to be sufficient, and your reaping is going to be the reaping of your abundance in good works. And sometimes that involves money, but it, whatever it involves, it's deeds in honor of the glory of God for the expansion of his kingdom, right? So, so give cheerfully and understand this is the principle of cheerful giving. He's not saying give to get. He's saying give to be abundant. Now, um, I don't know if I just messed you up or, or not. Like, you're, I'm not going to tithe anymore because I, I was hoping <laughs> that I would, you know. But he's, we we're taught to, to give cheerfully. Okay, those are three principles. Now, uh, let's talk about then, if those are uh, the, the, the principle of contentment, the principle of the widow's might, the principle of cheerful giving, if those three are real and true and right according to the scriptures, then what are our responsibilities when it comes to money and making kingdom decisions, and I just want to make some general observations that I think are really practical when it comes to, to you and, and me. Now, the first one is this. Like our first responsibility has to be to understand that we need to work for money. We need to work for money. Um, there is a rhythm in the scripture. We usually focus on it by way of Sabbath, right, that rest. Listen to this, Exodus 23, 12. Six days you shall do your work, but on the seventh day you shall rest, that you, your ox and your donkey may have rest, and the son of your servant woman and the alien may be refreshed. And oftentimes we'll use this to say, look, we need to practice Sabbath principles, which we do one day of the week. But do you know what the other six days are? Work. Work. Now, yes, this is an agrarian society. That means they're going to be working the the fields, or they're going to be, you know, tending their vineyards, they're going to be working with the sheep and the goats, all those kinds of things, but it still led to economy those six days. And so we have to realize, like, part of our responsibility here when it comes to making kingdom choices about money is to work six days and rest on the seventh. Now, uh, why do I say that? You're probably like, yeah, I work or we work or, you know, whatever. Many people are waiting for this sky-splitting moment, you know, where God is going to dump coins from the sky and everything's going to be taken care of. And sometimes that stuff happens. But, uh, and he always does his part. But our part is to work. That's what, that's what we do. So uh, our responsibility here, number one, work for the money that we uh, have. Second, we need to steward money because it all comes from God. So ask yourself this question. If we, we say our mindset is that I, I'm, a, I'm a, a person, uh, a believer living a new life in Christ, I've got a new identity, I answer the question, who's the king? He is the king. If he is the king and he's providing 
through your job or through work, through other means, whatever, he's providing, then it, it, we have to understand from a kingdom mindset that it's all his. And we have to come at this by asking this question, what do you want me to do, King Jesus, with this money? Right? So it's very different than me asking the question, what, do you, what should I do with this money? Because I'm inquiring of the Lord versus inquiring of me. Typically, when I inquire of me, it'll be things below. Typically, when I inquire of the Lord, it'll be things above. Now, don't, don't get me wrong. He meets needs in, in the below, below level. But oftentimes, the answer to the question will be eternal things, things that are going to last that he wants you to spend the money on. Uh, I don't know if you know this, but money comes in and goes out. It doesn't matter how little or how much. It comes in and it goes out. So if you just hold your hands like this, like you will have whatever money comes in for, for a moment, and then it goes out, right? A millisecond or whatever. It may be gone before you get it for some of you. I don't know. <laughs> but you, you have it for a second, and it's in that second that we become, or in that season, we become this, this manager, this steward of what has come in. And so we have to decide, like, what are we going to do with it? I have a daughter in college. I have another one that's going to go to college in 12 months. That's a lot exiting, right? And so you have whatever you have, and you have to ask yourself the question, what am I supposed to do with this God? Not just what am I supposed to do with this? Because the thing is, he, we are stewards. It is the king's money, and he often will call, call us to use it in an above way, an eternal way, and not a below way. Here's the third thing, is that it's our responsibility to share money with others in need on behalf of the king. It's our responsibility to share money with others in need on behalf of the king. Uh, you, you never know what sharing money with somebody is going to do in their life. I read this story this week that I thought was phenomenal, actually. <clears throat> it uh, it it's, comes from an ABC News affiliate in, in New York. They picked up this story from Georgia, and there was this kid, 19-year-old uh, student, Fred Barley. He was living in a tent in Georgia on Gordon State College, which is in Barnesville, Georgia, is a little school there. And uh, the police were called by somebody, probably he might have been up against an H HOA or something. I mean, nobody wanted this tent wherever, wherever it was. And so this kid was getting ready to get evicted by the police officers. The police officers show up. And uh, they, they, as normally they do, they ask, what you, what's going on? They hear the story. And, and the police officer reports, the story goes like, like this. Barley had ridden six hours from Conyers, Georgia, on his little brother's bike. Have you read, ridden a little kid's bike lately? I mean, like, your, your knees are like up by your ears on that thing. And, you, you know, it's hard. This kid, six hours from Conyers, Georgia, on his little brother's bike, carrying all his possessions, a duffel bag, a tent, two gallons of water, and a box of cereal. In order to enroll in his second semester at, at the school as a biology major, he arrived early before the semester to look for a job but didn't have any luck. The officer, whose name is Richard Carricker, told ABC New York, this is crazy. I can't arrest this kid who rode his bike and has a box of cereal and two gallons of water. So he was moved by it, and he and his partner put, put the student up in a, in a motel on their own dime. So they were, they were generous. They got him a motel room. They, they shared. They put him up for a night. Um, and then they began to tell the story, and word spread. Some people donated clothes, school supplies, funds to cover the rest of the motel stay so he could stay longer. He got a job at a local uh, pizza place, and his life, you know, began to have a little bit better hope than just a tent off campus. And then there was another lady named Casey Blaney of Barnesville 
who heard this story and, and started a GoFundMe page for Barley after spending time with him. And her quote is, I thought this kid just rode a 20-inch little boy's bike six hours in 100-degree weather. Somebody's got to help him. So she started this page, which raised $184,000, all of which is going to an educational trust for this student, Fred Barley, to pay his tuition, room, board, expenses, all, all that. Now, I hear a story like that, and I'm thinking about that police officer who goes, I'm not going to arrest this kid. I'm going to take my own money. I'm going to put, that looks very much like the story of the Good Samaritan to me, you know? I'm going to take my own money. I'm going to put this kid in a motel, and I'm just going to tell people about it, see what happens. $184,000 later, this kid has a way to go to college. So you just never know how sharing what the Lord has given you will make a difference. Uh, just this week, Angela and I and Haley actually were in the med center, and I came out, I, was, I, I kind of let Angela off and went to park, and then uh, Haley was still with me, and I was going to point her down the street to a coffee shop where she could study while we were doing our doctor stuff, and um, this man, so we came out onto the street, and there was a, a man sitting there, and he's like, can I ask you a question? I was like, oh, great. <laughs> Because I've done this before, and I end up buying, like, Subway for 200 people and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And so this guy goes, um, I need a dollar twenty-five. I'm like, what can you get for a dollar twenty-five these days, right? It was a very odd request. So I, I said, hey, t- tell me why you need a dollar twenty-five. And he, he just said, I need to get on the train and go to the, the VA. He was about probably 65 years old. And something like that, somewhere in there. And, and so I'm like, I don't have any cash, but I can take you to the little automated, automated thing and buy you the ticket, put you on the train so you can go to the, the VA. Okay, I keep expecting there to be a catch, you know, because I typically think, oh, he's going to use that $1.25 to go buy cocaine, which <laughs> you can't buy for $1.25. <clears throat> you know, and so... So I was processing, like, no, he's not going to buy cocaine. You can't get cocaine for $1.25. Right. And so I took him, and I just said, hey, man, tell me your story. As we're, We had to walk, like, two blocks to this, this thing. And he goes, I don't want to tell you my story. I'm afraid you won't buy me the train, train ticket. And I was like, I'm going to buy you the train ticket. Just tell me your story. He goes, well, I've been in jail. I actually got a physical coming out of jail. My blood work's all, all messed up, and so... I, they sent me to the VA because I'm a veteran. And I've been in jail for a year in Galveston. I was like, huh, I know the Galveston jail. Tell me, you know, and he knew all the right people, places. I knew he'd been in there. And uh, I, I listened to his story, and he wasn't a Christian, but, you know, trying to find his way and all that. And so I buy him the bus ticket, and we get done. And I say, hey, can I just pray? Can I just pray for you? And uh, this man was like, well, I won't turn down any help from anybody, not, not even God at this point, you know. And I said, okay, let me pray for you. And I put my hands on his shoulders. I don't think anybody had touched him in a nice way in a long time, you know. And uh, I just put my hands on his shoulders and I prayed for him maybe like three minutes. And in the middle of the prayer, I feel him just like starting to, you know, like a guy does when he doesn't want to cry, but he's starting to cry, and he was, he was doing that whole thing. And I prayed, he got done, and he said, uh, I, I really appreciate the light inside you. That's what he said. And I said, well, I just want you to know that's the spirit of Jesus. Because uh, honestly, I probably wouldn't have walked across the street other than Jesus to buy you a train ticket. I'm sorry, I'm not that good a person. But Jesus is. And he's just like, oh, man, thank you, thank you. And he got on the train and he left. I have no idea what the end of the story is. But you know what I knew my part was? Spend the dollar twenty-five, pray for him, tell him about, about Jesus. Right? Uh, could be the best dollar twenty-five I've ever spent in my life. I have no idea. I have no idea. But when you share like that, 
God does things. I don't know why or how or all the ways he works, but he, he, he does things. And so we always need to share money with others in need on behalf of the king. Leviticus chapter 23, verse 22, here's what it says. It's going to sound weird at first, but I'll explain it. And when you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap your field right up to its edge, nor shall you gather the gleanings after your harvest. You shall leave them for the poor and the sojourner. I am the Lord your God. So he's saying to them, look, it's an agrarian society. Everybody has a few. Planted something. He's saying, when it's harvest time, if I'm the Lord your God, leave the corners. Just harvest what's in the middle. Leave the corners for the people that are passing through or for the poor because they need something to eat. And so you would know two things by looking at someone's field at harvest time. One, that's a God person because they didn't harvest the whole field. And two, how generous they were by the size of the corners in their field. Right? If they're just trying to live the letter of the law, you might have like one stalk in the corner, like, hey. <laughs> you might have another guy that like the corners of his fields equals the amount that he harvested in, in between. Yeah. And so we need to be like, that's a part, that's the culture of who we are as people of the kingdom. That we we share because God has shared so much with us. And then here's the fourth, fourth responsibility we have is simply that we invest money for kingdom purposes. So while we're stewarding this money, we invest it. It's not like uh, we, just, we just somehow stockpile it or we're, we're flippant with it and what, we just let it go out, but we're smart with it and we invest it for things that are above, not things that are below. One example that pops for me is Luke chapter 8, 1 to 3. Listen to what it says. Soon afterward, he, meaning Jesus, went on through cities and villages, proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God. And the 12 were with him, and also some women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities. Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out. And I'll just stop right there. How many of you knew Mary Magdalene had seven demons exercised from her? A lot of people just, just think, oh, she was the woman that was also at the tomb when Jesus rose from the... But her life has changed because demons got ripped out of her by the Son of God. So she's investing, you see. And they list, list these names. Mary called Magdalene from whom whom seven demons had gone out, and Joanna, the wife of Husa, Herod's household manager, and Susanna with many others who provided for them out of their means. Now, these women were providing and investing in the Jesus movement in the first century. The one that sticks out for me beyond Mary with seven demons who's, who has become a disciple of Jesus is Joanna, whose husband is Husa, who works for Herod. So let's just follow the money for a second. Herod is paying Husa, and Joanna is taking Husa's salary from Herod and investing in Jesus' movement. Isn't that awesome, right? So we invest what comes in in the purposes of God, in the kingdom of God. We, we, we invest in these things, um, 2 Corinthians 9, 6 to 8, the collection that we talked about earlier for Jerusalem, this was a kingdom investment. This wasn't for the Corinthians to have a better anything in the, in the church of Corinth. This was for the, the Christians in Jerusalem to have their needs met, right? It's a kingdom investment. There's a guy in my life, uh, his name is Gary. In 2006, he, uh, 2005, he, he heard me preach. I was an associate pastor at his church, and I would preach like once every three months or something. And he would say like, uh, he said to me, it, he was a very honest man. He said to me, you're a pretty good communicator, but you stink at the history and context of the Bible. That's what he said. I'm like, who are you? I went to seminary and you're just sitting on road three. What are you, what are you, what are you talking about, you know? But he was right. He was so right. 
at that point. And so uh, he said, uh, but I, I'm not just going to tell you that. Like, like somebody else might complain. I'm going to do something about it. Do you want to go to Israel with me? I was like, a quick yes, yes. I want to go to Israel with you. He paid for me to go to Israel in 2005. $4,000 it cost him. $4,000. He said, I asked him, like, how can I pay this back? I don't want you to pay it back. It's a gift. It's an investment. It's an investment. So he kept saying, well, it was. I didn't know what kind of investment it would be, but I added up in my office this week, and I've taken 600-plus other people to Israel to learn the biblical text and context since that, since that time. It affects how I teach you uh, or anybody else that I have an opportunity to come in contact with. It, it affected how I wrote about uh, in the three or four books that I've written, it, it affected how I wrote on the family and the particular issues in the family based on my understanding of the biblical text and context. Another, another ministry came out of it called God's Army to fund veterans to go and experience hope and healing along this, this, uh, this path. And I look at that. I have still yet never paid to go to Israel. I've been to like 20 times. Not one, not one time. Not one time. How does that happen? I don't know. But this man made an investment. He made an investment, and it has had a ripple effect that I cannot deny. Right? He came. He was here uh, several, several weeks. Uh, it's been several weeks ago now. The sermon on sexual abuse that I was preaching, he was sitting right over here. And I was like... Dude, you're still investing. He drove from Katy just to go. <laughs> you know? So when you invest in things that are kingdom things, man, God uses that in ways that you, you might never, ever imagine. But we're, that's part of our responsibility is we invest money for kingdom uh, purposes, and he uses it uh, for his glory. And again, it's, it's not about your money or the percentage. It's about our hearts. See, it's about our hearts. He wants all of our hearts. And then the fifth responsibility here just harkens back to Hebrews 13, 5, where we started. It's simply this, worship God, not money. Keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Look, your money will leave you and forsake you. It will. Um, Just in this room, we could pull people up here that have stories that one day they had a lot of money, the next day they had no money. We We could pull people up here who have never had any money. We could pull, we, even if you were somebody who's always had money your whole life, one day there's going to be a funeral. You're going to be here. That money's not going to go with you. Now, people get to invest it. The cool thing about dying and going to heaven is that sometime in your life you get to determine, like, what's going to happen to that money when I die, if you have any Do you know that you can still invest it in the kingdom? You can set it all up where it invests in the kingdom however you want to invest it in the kingdom. But we worship God, not money, because money will let us down and God will never leave us or forsake us. And that's our responsibility to see no matter how much you have or how little you have, we worship God. 